If you grew up in the US, Canada, Mexico, and the UK in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, there's a good chance you knew the name Radio Shack. Radio Shack was owned by Tandy Corporation and operated over 8,000 Radio Shack stores worldwide and was the go-to place for anything electronics. They had everything for hobbyists as well as professionals and sold household electronics such as computers, stereo systems, electronic toys, CBs, and a lot more for everyday folks. Radio Shack sold its computers under the name brand Tandy and produced the rest of its electronics under the name brand Realistic. In fact, the Realistic brand began in 1954 under the name Realist but had to be changed because of an existing stereo Realist camera bearing the same name. The actual Realistic brand was officially founded in 1969. Realistic Electronics had both decent electronics at affordable prices and some higher quality and more expensive gear. They also dominated the market when it came to citizens' band radio transceivers. In fact, what was funny is that at the beginning Radio Shack began by sourcing most of its electronics from Japan, which back then was referred to as Nagasaki hardware and perceived as low-quality, inexpensive parts, while today we know that the electronics that came out of Japan was some of the best and highest quality. Looking through their old catalogs, you can see just how many different products they offered and throughout the years, I'm sure you either had something from Realistic in your home or visited someone's house who did. Another popular item was the AM-FM clock radios that sat atop everyone's night tables in the 1970s, 80s and 90s that we often blame for being late or not showing up at work because of a power failure. And of course, Radio Shack sold a bunch of these. In fact, one of their best sellers was the Realistic Chronomatic 104. And on my recent bi-weekly visit to the good old thrift stores, I found that exact same model. I own many alarm clocks, but had been looking for one with the flip type numerals, so I grabbed it right away when I saw it for only $14. The Chronomatic 104 was manufactured in 1975 and shown in a Radio Shack's 1976 catalog selling for $49.95, representing over $250 US, $350 Canadian, and €237 Euros in today's economy. The description boasts this clock as being their longtime digital bestseller that combines classic styling and advanced features that include the following. Quality built inside out, snooze bar, 0 to 60 minute sleep switch, 24 hour alarms, illuminated flip type numerals, on off and manual push buttons for all day listening, 3.5 inch speaker, AFC and ceramic filter for no drift FM that sounds superior, lighted slide rule dial and clock face, earphone jack, built-in antennas, and finally, a simulated walnut grain finish on plastic. It's a fairly large unit that looks like it's been through quite a few white nights in its day and early morning wake-up calls. It's dirty, its buttons are yellowed, and I'm not even sure if it works, but I'm hoping I can restore it to its original glory and set it on my night table and give it a new life. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm the Retro Repair Guy. Well, it's my first episode of 2023, but we're still in January, so I want to say, uh, you know, I don't know what the unwritten rule is, but I do want to say a Happy New Year and all the best for the new year to come. And, uh, you know, January is a special time also because it marks my third year that I'm beginning on YouTube. Yeah, three years already. Uh, so, you know, with that comes more pounds, <laughs> with that comes age. Um, but hopefully you'll see me go the other way now because uh, I started a little diet and yeah, it's, I guess New Year's resolution, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I got to lose 60 pounds. I gained 60 pounds. I already gained like over 20 something pounds just from the first show to now. Uh, you know, and anyway, so I, that, that's got to go. I'm going to be working hard at that. Um, also, I want to say a big thank you to all the new and existing subscribers because, and I'll never say that enough. Because, you know, without you, I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have a show. Uh, so I just want to say a big thank you. And, of course, a big, big thank you to Mrs. R.I.G. You know, I really love her to death. We have fun uh, filming these things together. And it's great when you have a partner in your life that you could do these things with. Uh, and I really do appreciate her. She supports me, you know, doing this channel and... and well, she's just terrific. So, uh, back to business. I do want to say, um, you know, a flip top clock, a flip top. No, not flip top, a flip numeral clock. Excuse me. I call them flip clocks. I don't know why, but whatever. You get the point. <laughs> the flipping numbers. Um, you know, I was really looking for one forever. And every time I go to eBay, you know, people are treating it like it's gold. They're asking for, you know, 200 bucks with the shipping to send you a clock like that. And, you know, these, these things are not worth 200 bucks, you know, people, <laughs> enough with the eBay stuff. So, uh, you know, I found it for 15 bucks, but every time I go to the thrift store, there's just none. And I have a bunch, a bunch of clocks here. Um, you can't see them maybe now, but I have a bunch there um, and I have some in a box. I, I must have over 20 clocks for sure. Um, but, and they're all from the, the 70s, you know, old clocks. 
uh, and some from the 80s. But the thing is, they're, they're all, you know, still digital. They're not uh, flip numeral. So I really wanted one and I really want to put it on my bedside. <laughs> of course, that makes Mrs. RIG so happy that I want to put it in her bedroom. But that's not the point. The point is I really was looking for one. And, uh, you know, when I found this for 15 bucks, I said, okay, I'm doing a restoration. And you know me, right? Uh, I have to go all out. And so I did look on, on YouTube, anybody uh, repairing these things. There's a few people repairing them, but nobody's done a full restoration like I've done on it uh, here. And of course, you know, because I go crazy. So of course, that's why we end up with a long episode again <laughs> for, for something small. And it wasn't uh, as easy as you think, you know, for a small clock to repair it and fix it up and all that. So anyways... I really hope you enjoy this episode and let's just dive right in. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. They make great quality PCBs from your Gerber files starting at only $5. All standard PCBs have now been upgraded for free from TG13140 heat resistance to TG150. If you're in need of getting your own PCBs manufactured at reasonable prices for production runs or simply a one-off PCB, they offer excellent quality and unsurpassed service to help you with your designs and free online quotes. And with their quick order feature, your parameters are automatically set from your Gerber files. With fast turnaround times and fast delivery, I definitely recommend checking them out. The link is in the description below. Eight, Eight seven, seven, six, six five, five, four, three, three two, two, one. one. This is not a dream. Eight, eight, seven, seven six, six, five, five four, four, three, three two, two, one. one. This is not a dream. One of the reasons I opened it before testing is that this unit was very dirty, and as anticipated, the interior of the unit had a large amount of dust that could cause shorts and damage the unit. So I vacuumed the interior prior to turning it on. When I plugged it in, the wheel began to spin and surprisingly the light still works, which is a good sign. Well, it works, but... However, I could not get any sound out of the unit no matter what button I pressed. So I jumped right in. So you might be wondering why um, this time I showed you the disassembly first and then the initial testing. Um, Look, first of all, you see me do it a lot, initial testing, I just plug it in and try it. Um, and I did it with the tape deck because I knew it was already busted. 
However, when you are fixing uh, something, especially like an old amplifier or anything like that, you want to be careful, okay? Uh, if grandma gives you a radio from the 50s or 60s and it hasn't been plugged in 20 years, last thing you want to do is plug it in and try it. No way, okay? Open it up. See, first of all, dust can cause all kinds of shorts. But second of all, you want to also make sure there's nothing damaged. Like if there's capacitors that have melted or anything like that, um, you don't want to start busting transistors on an amp, for example, um, and then they're hard to source uh, and all that. So better, better to just be careful and open it up first. If you're looking, you know, at a VCR or a CD player or a DVD with all the, the surface mount stuff that's on it from the 90s, it's not going to bust, but, uh, you know, it could, but I'm just saying, you know, big deal, right? But, but we're talking about older stuff like that. Now, this radio, like I said, I saw was really, really dirty, and I was right. As soon as I opened it up, I had to vacuum everything. I didn't want to cause shorts, so that's why I, I, I did in reverse like that. So that's my two cents. They're Canadian cents, so it ends up being free advice for the U.S. <laughs> Four, three, three, two, two one. one. This is not a dream. I began by tying the old tuner string because it was one of the things that worried me the most. The tuner was soldered to the board and I needed to get under the board to desolder the capacitors. I unscrewed the board from the unit, but before turning it over, I checked the fuse with a multimeter. I then did a visual inspection and realized the board is so dirty that it's hard to distinguish between any possible burnt component and the dirt. I decided to use my blower and the vacuum to remove as much dust as possible, but it was still pretty bad and it also looked like liquid had been dropped and burnt onto the board. So I went ahead and started removing the old capacitors and figured it would help me see a little better anyway. This is one of the circuit boards I hate the most. It's similar to the Shaw Lawrence I fixed a while back, where the traces are basically just filled with solder that comes off and also bonds to the trace next to it very easily when repairing. And as always, I tested the old capacitor only to prove that it was not only off spec, but showed 50 ohms of resistance. I opted to replace the old capacitors with Nishikon audio capacitors rated for higher voltage and heat tolerance. To assure proper adhesion to the board and connection because of the poor traces, I folded the legs of the caps onto the traces. Many, but not all, had been originally installed this way. I'm so used to going for my manual pump that I forgot I had purchased an electric pump. And because I cleaned up my workbench, I found the tips that go with it. Using it made for a much easier and cleaner removal of the old capacitors. While there was glue on the board, two of the caps looked like they could have leaked so I tested those as well and found a 47 microfarad testing at 72 with 39 ohms of ESR and the 470 testing at 594 with 120 ohms of resistance. Only normal after 50 years and something some people still don't understand. And this is where the repair took a nasty turn. I must have touched the string with my soldering iron so I asked my wife to put earmuffs on my 5 year old while I took out a pile of money for the swear jar. I figured it was best to go take a bath and cool down. Eight, Eight, seven, seven six, six, five, four, four three, three, two, one. This is not a dream.
couple of things when it comes to the tuner uh, string. Now the tuner string, um, this is the original one. This is where it was broken. And I'm not kidding. <sighs> like it really hurts the fingers and I cannot bust it, okay? It's really, really uh, strong. And God, I don't want to do this again on, the, on this one because it really hurts the fingers. And this is the new one. But just to show you, I'm putting just as much force, you know, it's just going right through my fingers. Now, this says 64 pounds. What is it? It's braided fishing line, okay? Um, 64 pounds, uh, it's a really amazing stuff. Now, there's 500 meters in there, and it costs nothing. I think it was 20 bucks or 500 meters. So you can replace a lot of tuner string with that. <laughs> but the reason why you want that, like I said, you don't use, uh, you know, your daughter's bracelet making uh, stuff, you know, because it's going to break. Um, it's really tightly wound all around, okay? And uh, not only, and the, the reason for that, or else it would slip. So to 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 turn everything. So it's got to be resistant. It's got to be strong. Now the other thing I want to tell you, if ever that happens to you, and, and by the way, because it's so tight, that's why as soon as you touch it with a soldering iron, anything, puff, right, the thing busts. Which probably is what happened to me. I tried to look at the video, but I couldn't see where I did that. And like I said, the square jar comes out. <laughs> Anyways, um, if that happens to you before you put a lot of money in the square jar, uh, even before, you know, take some pictures of how it is because that's one thing that I've never seen in service manuals that tell you, oh, here, just reinstall it like that and this is the path it takes. Never. I never see it in service manuals, okay? Uh, so <laughs> take some pictures of how it is or a little video. I mean, you know, today we all do that with our phones. So um, take, you know, take a look how the path, make yourself a little drawing where the string is going and everything. So like this, if it ever busts, do exactly what I did. Okay, stop everything, uh, remove it without cutting it so that you can measure the exact length because, you know, or, or how many turns, for example, is around that wheel. Okay, take note of everything. And uh, look, we should be successful doing it. Successful doing it. <laughs> Eight, Eight, seven, seven six, six, five, five four, three, three two, two, one. one. This is not a dream. Now that I was a bit calmer, I took a few pictures before dismantling what was left of the tuner cord. It was important to untie the cord to remove it and not cut it so that I could measure the exact length. This would save me a lot of trouble. I measured the thickness with a digital caliper for accuracy and ordered some new cord off the jungle site. Meanwhile, this gave me a little bit more freedom to move the board around and finish replacing the capacitors and clean the board on both sides with 99% alcohol and a soft toothbrush. With a clean board, I was able to perform a better visual inspection of the components and the traces. The cord came in, and it's a perfect match since I had measured 0.47 millimeters, and the new one stated it was 0.45 millimeters. This stuff is really strong and doesn't break easy, which is exactly what we wanted since the tuner cord needs to be pulled tightly around the pulleys. In fact, it's so strong that I needed sharper scissors to cut through it easily. I taped the old cord back together just to be able to measure and cut a piece of the new one to the same length. I cut it about 3 inches longer just to give me some wiggle space to be able to make a knot to tie the cord to the pulley but I put a mark to indicate where the original cord ended. Before I wound the cord back around, I thought it might be a good idea to finish every little thing as to not have another accident. So I cleaned the buttons that I was unable to remove as well as everywhere inside and out of the casing since I was unable to wash it in the sink.
there were two wires that connect to an Omron switch that had to be removed during disassembly that were too short, so I extended them and protected the solder joint with heat shrink tubing. I tested the three Omron switches one by one to make sure they're still functioning properly. I also cleaned the switches as well as the volume and the AM FM selector with electrical contact cleaner. When I removed the upper part of the casing, a piece of plastic had fallen out. I found where it went and I glued it back into place with some contact Gorilla Glue. I screwed the pulley back onto the tuner and winded the cord all around. At first, to my surprise it was way too long until I realized that when it comes back to the pulley, I had to wrap around it once more. Once the cord was secured, I made sure it worked properly before making the final knot at the pulley. I then installed the needle, making sure it goes end to end as I turned the channel selector knob. Once I knew everything was working properly, I added a bit of hot glue to replace the green one that was previously in place to secure the needle and to prevent the spring from coming out of the hole on the pulley. I used a half-sized popsicle stick to apply the glue as to not risk having the hot tip of the tool touch the cord and break it again. And of course, just when I thought I was done, I found a tiny little capacitor hiding for its life under the pulley behind the AM FM selector switch. It was poorly installed and had a tiny piece of electrical tape wrapped around one leg tying it to a wire that was falling off and melting. So I cut the wire and removed the tape. This allowed me to pull the capacitor out. I needed to replace the wire completely and while doing so I noticed the connection to the other wire on the volume knob was completely corroded so I first resoldered that connection. This capacitor was probably the cause of having no sound so I of course tested it only to find that this one microfarad capacitor was testing at 1.5 with 5% voltage loss and 99 ohms of resistance. I soldered two new wires and capacitor between the volume knob and AM FM selector switch. I cut the wires longer to make a neater installation and make it accessible and I properly protected the connections with heat shrink tubing.
I also thoroughly cleaned the Enigmatic motor, which is responsible for driving the clock's mechanism and keeping time. I used both electrical contact cleaner and a couple of drops of WD-40 and spun it around multiple times until it spun without friction and was silent. I tested it by giving it some power to see if it was turning freely and also to see if a little resistance would stop it, but it worked perfectly and kept turning without making any more grinding noise. I wiped down the numbers with a lint-free cloth without any product on it just to remove dirt and dust. I think it's finally time to reassemble the unit. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This is not a dream. Okay, so one last note on the repair. Now, um, for those who don't do electronics, you might be wondering 
why there was a capacitor between the AM FM selector switch uh, and the volume knob or the potentiometer. Now its function is basically to filter out DC voltage. Uh, and I say filter out, but it's more it has to block completely out the voltage. Uh, now that results in better sound quality as well as um, distortion. It, it removes distortion. So what happens is when you have a capacitor like that, that's off spec like this one or completely blown, which I believe was the case here. I had no sound, everything else was working. Um, um, and you know, again, it depends on the circuit design, but you'll e either end up with, you know, horrible sound, uh, muffled sound, or absolutely no sound, things like that, or there's going to be some distortion. So that's one, one place you'll want to look. Now, another thing is, um, I wanted to tell you, there's a few people who asked me, how come I never fix tuners? Um, now, I thought this is the perfect time to test. I have this little thing here. Um, I, you know, those FM transmitters, uh, and it's a Bluetooth and it doesn't have the big cigarette lighter thing. So it's USB, it's FM transmitter, and you can send Bluetooth in it. So I figured perfect, perfect. Um, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to be able, you know, and, and the reason for those who don't know, uh, is the copyright strike right on YouTube. I can't play any music I want, not even from the radio. I'll get a copyright strike. So the thing is, is that. Uh, with this, I can send my own music that I license. Uh, so if that works out, I've got a beautiful Harman Kardon tuner um, that we could take a look at. And at least I won't be afraid to play some music and to try it out because I was wondering, how do I try out those things? And I don't know why I didn't think about that before, uh, but this is fantastic. So let's go listen to what it sounds like. Eight, Eight seven, seven, six, six five, five, four, four three, three, two, two. One, one, one. This is not a dream. Eight, eight, seven, seven six, six, five, five four, four, three, three two, two, one. one. This is not a dream. I purchased this little Bluetooth FM transmitter to send my own music to the radio and avoid any problems. Plugging it in provides power, but there's no more grinding noise from the enigmatic motor that we see turning. I was able to set the time, and both the sleep and snooze bar seemed to work perfectly.
I set the transmitter to 93.4 as all I was getting was static on the channel. The transmitter needs to be closed by the radio to get optimal performance. It seems to be working. This is the real sound coming out of the radio speaker and recorded by the camera. Fairly decent in my opinion. All right, well, there you have it, a flip numeral clock, and I'm gonna get it right this time, <laughs> flip numeral clock. Uh, you know, nothing is simple, right? Even a little thing like that, I go all out and it was complicated, uh, but you know, it's beautiful. I hope it lasts another 50 years. And uh, I really want to put it on my night table. You know, Mrs. RG was like, no, it's not going on my night table. But um, you know what? It's beautiful and I really want to keep it there. I, I love these old things, you know? And this one really looks nice. So anyways, and by the way, this clock, it's the exact same one, this, this realistic as the GE. They're identical, identical inside and everything. So anyways, um, and that being said, if you've enjoyed the content and if this is your first time here, please subscribe, hit the notification button, and you know, um, put the thumbs up because uh, all those things help the channel grow because YouTube sees all that and it helps me grow and I can bring you more and more content. And if you want to support the channel in other ways, um, there's going to be some links uh, down below here. Uh, you can donate, you can join Patreon, there's all kinds of stuff. And I'm selling t-shirts now. I, I, I didn't wear one, I ordered one and they actually blocked one of my designs. There was two designs there uh, because Mrs. RIG was wearing a Supergirl costume and they said it's a DC character. So go whatever, even though she was like in a bobble head and it was a pretend, you know, costume, but doesn't matter. That's been blocked. So, and I don't, I don't print them myself here. Uh, so I'm going to make a new one, but there's still the mugs and the RIG uh, logo and all that. So uh, if you want, you can support the channel in that way as well. And of course, a lot of these items that I fix here, I sell them on my website at retroapairguy.com. And um, if you want to donate anything to the show, again, retroapairguy.com, uh, there's a contact uh, form. You can just send me the information and I'll respond. And aside from that, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll see you soon with another restoration. Bye-bye. <laughs>